Can you hear me now? There we go. I'm going to try that again. If you haven't met me before, my name is Pastor Jason. I'm the New Anthem West Campus Pastor. And we're so excited that you're here this morning. Man, I believe God has a word for you that's going to encourage your heart and your souls today. And I want to um, harp on what Alyssa was saying earlier. Hey, if you've been coming here for some time, we've got some awesome opportunities for you to plug in. One of the ways is to get involved in small groups. Small groups just started off this past week. I'm in the men's group, and it was absolutely amazing. It was just a blessed time for us. And so I just want to encourage you guys to get plugged into small groups. You can sign up on our website, or you can let one of our staff know up, up at the connection point. We're on our third week of the Essential Series third week of our essential series. And man, I don't know about you guys, but I have been massively blessed by this series. And my I watch is talking to me now. Wow. Third week of our essential series, the Beatitudes, and I've just been blessed by it. Pastor John opened us up a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about what it means to be poor in spirit and how we receive the kingdom of heaven. And one of the things that Pastor John said that encouraged my heart was the posture of our hearts should be one of desperation. When we're desperate, when we recognize that we have a need for God, God gives us his kingdom. And then the second thing that Pastor John talked about a couple of weeks ago is when we mourn, God comforts us. And one of the things that was encouraging to me is in Christ, there is no need for us to self-protect our emotional or our mental state. Isn't that amazing? That we can trust God with all of our emotions, with all of our feelings, with anything that we're going through when it comes to ment our mental state. We can trust God with it and God will provide for us. So we're in our Beatitudes series right now. And one thing that I want us to know about the Beatitudes or the essentials is that they are foundational for our faith journey. These are truths that God wants to be a reality in our faith walk. God created us to live out these truths or these foundations, and we can trust God as we journey together to stand on or be marked by these essentials, or as the Bible calls them, the Beatitudes. Why? Because life is better for us when we stand on these truths or these foundations. This is what following Jesus looks like. These foundations can also be used to reflect the light of Jesus in our lives to others. When we live like this, others are going to see Jesus instead of seeing our emotions, instead of seeing our feelings, instead of seeing whatever it is that we feel in the moment. They'll see Jesus when we live and when we stand on these Beatitudes. Here's one thing I want to point out for us this morning. These Beatitudes or essentials are not rules or standards for us to live by to become Christians. Do we get that? This is not a rule book for us that we need to look at learn and apply to our lives in order for us to be saved. No, this is what happens when we become believers. When we become followers of Jesus, Jesus is molding us and to look more like his son Jesus. And what does that look like? These beatitudes. It means to be poor in spirit. That's what Jesus is transforming us into. To mourn. Why? Because we can trust God. And to be meek. That's what Jesus is transforming us into after we become believers, after we become followers of Jesus. A little backstory about me. I grew up in the church. When I was a baby, my parents were already going to a church, and they took me to a church. And at that church, I was learning a lot. We were going on Sundays, on Wednesdays, on Fridays. On Wednesdays, we had a wana, so there was a lot of scripture memorization happening. A lot of people were teaching us a lot of things. We were taking part in prayer on Fridays. And one of the things that I started to realize as I got older is that I started to misunderstand what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. What do I mean by that? Well, I started to look at Christianity as a do's and don'ts. How to act. What to wear or not to wear. Whether you chew gum or not. Yes, this is true. I walked into church chewing gum one time, sat down for a service, and somebody walked up to me and put his hands out in front of me. And said, so I was like, are you sure about that? Like, it's in my mouth. And you, he's like, yup, you're not a Christian if you chew gum. Okay. Or I had a friend who ended up wanting to get an earring, and he went and got an earring, and he came to church. And guess what happened to that, that boy? Somebody walked up to him and ripped the earring out of his ear. Yeah, that's my church experience growing up. Church hurt. And so I started to get lost in the do's and don'ts, and I started to feel conflicted. I started to feel guilt and shame. Why? because I started to look at the Beatitudes and everything else in the Bible as rules that I needed to live by. And I would try to live by them, but guess what? I couldn't live by them 100% of the time. 
And every time I failed, I felt guilty and I felt shame. And that did not draw me near to Jesus. It pushed me further away from him, which is why I ended up leaving church as a teen. I realized I couldn't do it. Instead of living in the freedom that Jesus wanted to give me when I received his free gift of grace, I felt more and more guilt, and I felt like I couldn't do anything, or I couldn't play the part of what it meant to be a Christian. I want to tell you guys today that that's not what Christianity is. Jesus bids us to come as we are. That's what Revelation 22, 17 tells us. The Spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, and let the one who is meek, and let the one who, no, that's not, no, let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price come. Here's what religion says. Religion says, you want God? Do this. Do that. Don't do this, don't do that. Say this and say that, but don't say these things. That's what religion says. Jesus says, you want God? Come. Come to me. Come as you are. There isn't anything that we can work up to for our salvation. All we need to do is come, and Jesus gives us that ever-flowing everlasting water for our souls. And then what happens after that? Transformation takes place. And that's what these beatitudes are. It's when Jesus starts to mold us and to look more like him. And so Jesus is preaching to thousands and thousands of people here in Matthew 5. He's on the mountainside. And this is happening thousands of years ago. But he's sitting down and he's just, he's preaching to the crowd there. And he begins laying out the foundations for what it means to be a follower of Jesus. How Jesus can, starts to transform us when we put our faith and trust in him. We're going to be reading in Matthew 5, 3 through 12 this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open it up. If not, we'll have it up on the screen for you today. And we're going to read in 5, 3 through 12, and then we'll jump in our verse for this morning. Matthew 5, 3, 12 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For, the, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And today we're in Matthew 5.5, 5, which says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, thank you that you've brought us here today. Thank you, God, that you've brought us to listen to what you have for us this morning in your word. God, I pray for distractions to be removed this morning. God, that you would open our hearts to be receptive of your word. God, that there is life change that happens. God, that your spirit would come and fill us. That there would be a renewing of our minds. That we would live the best that we can for you. Thank you, God, for laying out these beatitudes for us, for giving us this word for us to be able to know what it means to follow Jesus. Thank you, God, for transforming us to look more and more like Jesus. We love you and we thank you. God, may I decrease and may you increase today. Would you speak to us by your spirit? And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. So this morning, we're going to be talking about what it means to be meek and what it means to inherit the earth. Meekness is essentially this. It's to be humble, it's to be gentle, and it's to be lowly. To be meek is to put others before ourselves. 
What that means is that we don't assert ourselves over others by trying to push our own agenda or by trying to make our agenda happen. What does pushing our own agenda look like? Well, we can push our own opinions about many things, such as how we should remodel a home or our political beliefs. I know I say this a lot, but man, is this the truth about our current culture right now? What kind of car we should own? Who the best sports player is, Michael Jordan? What the best team is, Detroit Pistons? Um, what is a good company to work for? Whether dogs or cats are better, dogs. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love cats too. Um, all of these things, when we hold strong opinions and are only interested in pushing our agenda, can lead us into arguments and putting others down. Instead of being gentle, instead of being humble, instead of being lowly, we're more interested in forcing what we believe to be right or true upon someone else, even if it means getting into that argument. But what does a meek person do? A meek person submits themselves to God and puts others first. Here's the thing. I don't want us to mistake meekness for weakness. A lot of people hear weak when they read about or hear about meekness. Here's one, how one theologian puts it. In the vocabulary of the ancient Greek language, the meek person was not passive or easily pushed around. The main idea behind the word meek was strength under control. Here's the example of that. Like a strong stallion that was trained to do the job instead of running wild. Meekness is strength under control. And we see that active in Jesus' life all throughout scriptures. We know that Jesus is all-powerful, yet he does not misuse it. Jesus used his strength for the kingdom of God and not for his own purpose. Meekness means that we don't retaliate when we're wronged against. And we don't react with pride or narcissism. We're not full of ourselves. Instead, we are full with God's spirit and we respond in a humble and gentle way putting others first. So I'm going to have four points for us this morning. We're going to go through four points. And if you're taking down notes, go ahead and write these notes down. Our first point for this morning is the meek trust in God. Psalms 37.5 says, commit your way to the Lord. That's trusting in God. Trust in him and he will act. You see, trusting God is essentially letting go of ourself and our own understanding. That's what Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 tells us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. It's how we respond to situations in our lives. It's how we respond to circumstances and how we respond to obstacles and valleys in our lives. Are we trusting in God who promises to act? Or are we responding out of our feelings, out of emotions, out of our resentment, out of bitterness? One theologian puts it this way, biblical meekness is rooted in the deep confidence, the deep confidence that God is for you, God is for you, for you, and for you, and not against us. Romans 8.31 tells us that. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I'm sure many of us are going through something in our life this morning. Conflicts, hardships, valleys obstacles. God may have called you to go in a specific direction in your life, but you hit a roadblock. Here's what I want to tell you today. That roadblock doesn't mean that God isn't with you. One who is meek trusts in God and places their confidence in the fact that he is with us. It's true. That's what scriptures tells us. God is with us. Here's the beauty about what we go through whether it's obstacles or valleys or sufferings of all kind, what they do is they help shape us and mold us to become more like Jesus. And God is using all these things to make us look like Jesus. Your good, your obstacles, your skills, your hardships, your battles, your highs, your lows, everything. God is with you in every part of your life. And trusting in God is trusting and believing that he is for us. Trusting in God is also believing that he's in the unknown. Believing that he's in our valleys. And that he wants to lead us into a life of blessings that this world can't offer. That's why Jesus starts off Matthew 5, 5 with blessed. 
Those who trust in God by committing their life, their action, their thoughts, their feelings and emotions to God are blessed. What I don't want us to misunderstand is, is blessed isn't, or blessing isn't wrapped up in some worldly or earthly entertainment or comfort. No. Blessedness is heaven's hope for us. That's what Pastor John told us a couple weeks ago. The kingdom is happy when we live out these truths in our lives. Jesus is happy. This is what causes heaven to lean in and say, good job. Jesus is proud of us when we live according to these beatitudes. And when we trust God in the face of evil, when we posture our hearts under the authority of Jesus to do good, that's what meekness is. Psalms 37.3 tells us, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. This is something that I'm going to be saying today throughout the rest of this message. How we respond matters. How we respond holds value. And that leads us to our second point this morning. Point two is the meek are self-controlled. The meek are self-controlled. How we respond to others is so important. And that's, there's two folds of that. Number one, it's what we do, and it's also what we say. Check out Proverbs 25, 28. It says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. A person without self-control, man, that sounds like havoc to me. That's why what we say and do is huge and it has value. And how we respond to people and what we do and what we say to them is huge and it matters. Ultimately, everything in our world says that we need to respond quickly and aggressively, but it runs in contrast to what God tells us. Look what God tells us in Psalms 37, 8. Refrain from anger. Forsake your wrath. Fret not yourself. Don't worry. Why? Because when we worry, we think that we have to act and we respond out of anger and we pour out our wrath on people. What does that do? It says it tends only to evil. So I want to ask us this morning, when we do respond with anger and wrath, how often does that situation go well? When we allow ourselves to let go and let that person have a piece of our mind, how well does it go for us? Isn't that the world we live in today? Respond to others how they respond to you. You got to defend yourself. Don't allow people to take advantage of you. Give them a piece of your mind. That's what the world tells us. We are taught nowadays to respond to others how they respond to us. But God promises us that he will act. That's why we can trust in him. Now, how do we do that? By committing our ways, our feelings, our emotions, what we say, what we do, our words, our thoughts to God. What does God want our response to be? He wants it to be good or holy. And another way for us to be able to have self-control is what we say. I think that's also a big part of it for us. And so I believe we need to have our perspective right about our reaction or what we're saying with our tongue. Check out what James 3 tells us about the tongue. But no human being, this is James 3, 8 through 10, no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father... And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursings. My brother, these things ought not to be so. How quickly do we react without self-control when we feel offended? I've done it before. Many instances with my wife, Jessica, when we've gotten into arguments, and she says something hurtful to me. My response was, I need to say something hurtful back to her so she can feel what I'm feeling in the moment. That's not self-control. Or what about when she's getting ready to say something to me, and I've got this experience with arguing with her now, right? We've been arguing for like three years in our relationship, and so now I'm like, I know where this is going to go. Once she starts this sentence with these words, she's about to go into this situation, and so I'm going to be like, hey, stop right there. This is what you're about to say. Don't say that. And she's like, I was actually just about to apologize. And I'm like, oh, missed the opportunity. You see, I was controlled by emotions and feelings. And in those moments is when my tongue does nothing but damage and hurt and curse. 
But here's what trusting God looks like in the midst of all these different circumstances. When we trust God with our tongue, God transforms us to be meek and to have self-control. And the tongue that could, be, could do damage and be used for evil can be used for good, for peace, and for gentleness. James 3, 17, 18 tells us that. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Man, if you want to know what meekness is, read James 3, 17 through 18. It's right there. When we trust and submit ourselves to God, our response becomes pure. It becomes peaceful. It becomes gentle and reasonable, full of mercy, sincere and fair-minded. A follower of Jesus breaks the cycle of evil and violence by refusing to participate in it. That's why how we do and say things matters. We have a beautiful portrait of meekness in Matthew 26, 50 through 54 for us. This is when Jesus was getting arrested. I want to read that for us this morning. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. This is when they're arresting him. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus, one of his disciples, stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. You guys ready for this? Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? This is Jesus' purpose in the next line. But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it may be so? The advancement of God's kingdom was more important than his self-defense. Even to the point where after the servant's ear was cut off by one of his disciples, Jesus healed the servant's ear. The same person who's about to finish arresting him. True meekness is self-controlled. And here's what motivates us, friends. God's kingdom is what motivates us to respond instead of our own agendas. Point three for us this morning is the meek wait on God. Psalms 37, 7 tells us that. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. The meek wait on God. God wants us to be still before him and wait patiently for him. What does that mean exactly? This all depends on how much time we are spending with God every single day. I'm not saying that you just sitting at home staring at the walls waiting for something to happen is that. No. In order for us to wait on God and to trust God, we have got to saturate ourselves with his word. We need to set time aside to meditate on the very words of God for us that we have available for us. I also believe prayer is such an important wait for us to be still before God. There's just something about sitting in the presence of God, waiting to hear from God that is so fulfilling for us. Because in those moments is when God aligns our hearts with his and in our waiting on God to act, we begin to respond to others as we're led by his spirit. God promises us that he's got this. How many times does something happen in our lives and we run full speed ahead into that situation without going to God in prayer or searching his word for direction? I remember a time when I did that. Back in 2018, we were looking for ways to leave Arizona and to move to Las Vegas. But I couldn't do that because the job that I was working at was located in Arizona. And so I started to do some job searches. I actually even went out to Las Vegas. I had an interview there to try to figure out, hey, like, can I get this job? Can I move to Las Vegas or not? Eventually, I got promoted at my job that I was at, and I got to work from home. And working from home meant I can live anywhere I want. And so I was like, man, this is a great opportunity for us. We're moving to Vegas. Literally, moving to Vegas. Right then and there, we're moving to Vegas. No prayer, no waiting on God, no nothing. I made that switch really quick. I even made my family believe that this was the right decision for us by telling them this is, this is what God wanted for us because I wanted it so bad. Life in Las Vegas wasn't comforting or peaceful for us. Why? Because we were running and I was running after my own desires. I didn't wait on God to act and to lead me. 
Had I waited on the Lord and prayed about the different opportunities that presented itself with my promotion, and had I saturated myself with the word of God, things might have looked different for us. What I want us to see here is that heart posture is key. Even if God was in our move in Vegas, our attitude and heart posture would have been very different than what we encountered. We leaned on our own understanding instead of going to God for his understanding. And we didn't experience peace there. The beauty of it is that God worked through my bad decision to bring about good. Even in our mess. Why? Because we probably wouldn't have moved back to Michigan if we didn't move to Las Vegas. But life in Las Vegas wasn't comforting or peaceful for us. On the other end of our waiting, when we do wait on God to act, when we patiently wait on God, is peace. That's what Psalms 37, 11 tells us. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. When we wait on the Lord to act in our life, we experience his peace. That's what Psalms tells us. Whatever that situation looks like for you, whether it's an easy situation or a hard situation, God promises us peace when we're meek when we're self-controlled, when we trust in him. Can I just say that that which you believed God has promised you, God hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't forgotten you in that situation. He hasn't forgotten you for what you're waiting for. God's got you. We don't need to jump the gun and react right away or make a decision. Think of it this way. Is it too uh, soon for Christmas movie examples, by the way? Yeah. I'm already listening to Christmas music, so no judgment here. I'm kidding. I'm not listening to Christmas music yet. Um, But anyways, Jingle All the Way. Has anybody seen that movie before? It's one of my favorite Christmas movies. There's a scene in that movie where Arnold Schwarzenegger is at work and gets a call from his son, and his son is like, hey, Dad, are you going to be able to make it to my event? And he's like, yeah, of course. Like, I'm going to make it. I promise. He promised him he's going to be there. Guess what? He didn't show up, and the son was disappointed. That is an example of an earthly parent. But I got good news for us. God isn't designed like our earthly parents. God does come through. Some of us are struggling with how we're feeling because we feel like God forgot us or we just don't want to wait. Because that comes from if I wait, I don't know if God is going to show up or not. And we end up making decisions based on our early earthly experiences. But God is not earthly. God doesn't let us down. Man, what a promise for us here in Psalms 37, 9 about waiting on the Lord. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. When we wait on God, we receive an inheritance from him. That's our fourth point for this morning. The meek inherit the earth. Matthew 5, 5 tells us that blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You see, when we give ourselves over to peacefulness instead of evil or violence, Jesus is telling us that we inherit the earth. When we pursue peace amongst the havoc in the world, we're able to enjoy the beauty of our earth, which is given to us by our Lord Jesus. I want us to see something here with the word inherit. The translation in the original language for inheritance is to receive the portion assigned to one, to receive an allotted portion, or to become partakers of, to obtain. Inheritance means that we receive what is ours. How? How do we receive what is ours? How does it become ours? It becomes ours when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, when we accept his free gift of grace, and when we call Jesus the Lord of our lives, we turn away from our sins, and we turn to Jesus for that everlasting water that we need. We become children of God, and when we're children of God, we have an inheritance. Isn't that amazing? Think of it this way. When I was a kid and I was going to school, I used to tell my friends, hey, do you want to come over to my house? Do you want to come hang out at my house? Right? Here's a question. Is it really my house? No, it's not. My parents own the home. If you pull up the title or the deed of that home, my name won't be on that title or deed. But it was my house to a certain extent. Why? Because it was my parents' home and I lived with them. What, what was my parents became mine because it's an inheritance that I get because I'm my parents. I can do everything I want in that house. I can go to the refrigerator and take out food. I can go play in the yard. I can hang out in the basement. I've got my own room where I can sleep, right? 
Here's the beauty of it. When we're followers of Jesus, we become children of God. Therefore, we inherit what is his because we're his. We're also believing in a coming inheritance. Why? Because Jesus was raised from the dead. We have a hope, and that's our coming inheritance. He's alive, and he's coming back, and one day we will be in eternity with him. No more sin, no more sickness, no more disease, life full of abundance and joy in the presence of God. Our future is secured when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus. We will not face judgment or condemnation anymore. You see, we have a forever future that is full of abundance and joy that far outweighs what this world can offer. And salvation is our guarantee for all of us that are put our faith and our trust in Jesus. All of those who pursue peace and respond with meekness in the face of evil and violence will inherit the earth and have a coming inheritance that is held for us in heaven. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 tells us that. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. This is what's ours when we're his. When we're his, this is what's ours. That is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Jesus also tells us about our inheritance in Matthew 5, 12. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You might be someone today that's wondering, man, Pastor Jason, like this is, this is all good stuff. This is amazing. This is great. But I'm wondering, how can I respond to that evil, to that violence, to that conflict when someone offends me, when says, someone says something that hurts me? How do I respond opposite of this world? Pastor Jason, I know I don't respond the way I should in these situations. I want to give people a piece of my mind. Hey, I do too. That's, you guys heard my example. I do at times as well. Here's the truth and the reality for us. In Jesus, we find freedom that delivers us from how the world teaches us to respond. So I want to encourage you this morning to trust that God's got your back. He's for you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you if you put your faith and your trust in him. Lay your obstacles, your valleys, your lows, your conflicts your arguments, your bitterness, everything at the feet of Jesus. And be encouraged and trust and believe in the fact that God is for you. Amen? Let's pray as we close today. God, what a timely truth this is for us today. In the midst of all the havoc in the world, in all of the mess, you are teaching us how to respond from a place of meekness. We're so thankful, God, that we have your very words at our disposal so we, we can read and that we can learn and that we can apply to our lives, God, so that we can be continually transformed to look more like you. You've called us out of our sin and in our shame and into your presence to become children of God. Why? Because you've called us to be witnesses in this world so that people can experience life change that is only found in Jesus. Thank you for that truth, God. Thank you for who you are. Thank you, God, that even in our mess and our sin and our shame, that you don't leave us. Thank you, God, that even when we make a mistake, that you don't forsake us. Thank you, God, that even though we don't know what to do, you know what to do and that you will act for us. Help us to trust you more and more, God, as we grow closer to you in a relationship. Help us, God, to have self-control. Jesus, continue to transform us 
to have self-control. And God, help us to wait on you to act in our life so that we can leave, so that we can live in peace, that we can receive a supernatural joy and abundance from you that we cannot receive from this world. God, we love you and we thank you for who you are. Be with every single individual that is here today, God. Clear any distractions. Bless us as we leave this morning and we ask this and we pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, thank you guys so much for being here. Love you guys. And the church staff always prays for you. And our prayer is this, that the Lord bless you and keep you, causes his face to shine upon you, turns his countenance towards you, be gracious to you and give you peace. Why? Because the best is yet to come. See you guys next week.